About 10 years ago, I introduced a good friend of mine to the world of craft beer and eventually homebrewing. Now, prior to this, he was an intermittent drinker of Guinness and the occasional Bud Light. Though within just a few months, his refrigerator had been taken over by cans and bottles of beer that earlier that year he'd never heard of. Uh, his excitement was palpable, and in his plight to learn more about this newfound love, he stumbled on a website where users were free to provide their feedback on basically every beer in existence. My buddy created his very own Beer Advocate account and soon joined the troop of drinkers leaving their ratings and reviews. I'd occasionally pop in to see what others thought about the beers I was considering buying, and I noticed a few things that made me question the veracity of these, these reviews. Uh, you're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and in this episode, contributor Matt Delphi Fiaco is back for the second part of our series on bias in beer. And I am so excited to finish this one out um, because, I mean, I guess in no way are we finishing it out, right? Like there's just <laughs> so much more to talk about, but I, it's it's one of my favorite topics. Um, and I think some of the studies that we're going to be discussing today, um, and we, uh, you know, especially the ways in which your senses are very reliant on one another Absolutely. Um, for their actual perception. And they're, they're very uh, interwoven. It's going to be a fantastic continuation of this discussion. Um, and I am super excited to hear about that beer advocate story because I actually have no <laughs> idea where you're going with it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, no. So, so my thing, what I started to notice was I'd, I'd hop on and I would look at these reviews and I'd say, you know, one person would be saying all of these things. And if you haven't been to a beer rating site like that, there's now rate beer and there's other beer rating sites as well. Uh, people do it on their blogs. They, they usually will leave, uh, uh, you know, like appearance, aroma, flavor, mouthfeel, and then they give their summation of it. Well, I'd go and on the same beer, I'd see just completely varying different, you know, different descriptors used in any of these sections. And it started to make me wonder how did the environment within which these people were tasting the beer, uh, whether that beer was old or whatever, it made me wonder to what extent they were biased by preconceived notions about this beer. Uh, sometimes the the uh, the descriptions would align exactly with what, say, you might find on the bottle from the manufacturer. It tasted exactly like that. Were they biased by that? So uh, it was just something that I noticed and I always kind of held in the back of my mind. Uh, real quick, I want to I wanna give just a quick heads up. If you haven't already listened to episode 63, the one that came out just before this one, I'd encourage you to do so before getting too deep into this one, only because we're going to be referencing some stuff that uh, we talked about in that show. We've got a few more really interesting experiments to chat about, uh, some performed by others, and a couple that we've done ourselves. I think it's going to be a fun one, uh, almost as fun as being a part of the Brew Club, which is a free uh, club that offers members the opportunity to have their very own experiment published on brewlosophy.com. Also, those who tag photos of their brew day on social media with hashtag brew a beer, that's B R U A beer, or brewlosophy. Uh, will be entered into a drawing to have their photo featured in our monthly newsletter, The Hot Beat. They'll also receive some Brewlosophy stickers. Uh, learn more about becoming a member of The Brew Club at thebrewclub.com. That's the B-R-U club.com. And make sure to subscribe to The Hot Beat using the form in the sidebar at brewlosophy.com. Uh, if you want to help us to continue producing the content we do, you can visit brewlosophy.com slash support. Use the links that you find there when you do your online shopping. You don't feel a thing. We get a little kickback that helps us out. Uh, you can also become a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, which will earn you some nifty rewards for committing to a, a monthly contribution of as little as a buck a month. Patrons receive access to never before published recipes, awesome discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly Q&A with some pretty cool folks. Russian Rivers Vinny Chalurzo, Dr. Charlie Bamford from the UC Davis Brewing Program, Pico Brews Annie Johnson, John Kimmich from The Alchemist, just to name a few. Uh, also, patrons who pledge at the $5 level or higher are entered into a monthly drawing for a $50 gift certificate from our good friends over at lovetobrew.com. Again, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to learn more about being rewarded for helping us out. Uh, just another quick reminder that I'm going to be in Asheville, North Carolina next March, giving a seminar on experience experimentation in beer with Denny Khan. We're going to be doing two identical sessions, each one with only 35 spots in it. So uh, if you plan to go, I'd suggest registering sooner than later. It's going to be a great time and we'd love to hang out. Uh, if you haven't already, please do us a huge favor by leaving a rating and review of this show in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Uh, not only do we appreciate the feedback, it does uh, you know inform some of the, the decisions that we make about the show, but those ratings help others to more easily find the show as well. 
All right, feedback this week is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Uh, Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique and hard-to-find items for both the home and craft brewing markets, including high-quality stainless fittings at competitive prices and very fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com, and don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Come. Okay, Adrian Grisoris from San Antonio, Texas wrote in to say, I just listened to your Boil Vigor podcast and had a comment. Having restarted brewing just over a year ago, I've been surprised that a rolling boil throughout the full time of the boil seems to be the most common recommendation for Boil Vigor that I can find. You see, besides home brewing beer, uh, my other time sucker is cooking. I'm also a physician, so I know a lot about medicine, some about science, and a good bit about cooking, uh, and a little bit about brewing, he says. <laughs> to me, uh, brewing beer is very similar to making a consomme, or if you leave out meat, a vegetable stock. Uh, in both those situations, most recipes recommend bringing the liquid to a full boil, then reducing the heat to maintain a, sim- maintain a simmer for the rest of the cooking. With your descriptions in the podcast, I think this would be a very reasonable way to brew. I wonder if that would negate the difference that was seen in the unibrow experiment. Matt, that's the one that you performed, uh, where a statistically significant difference was seen between brewing only or boiling only at 194 degrees Fahrenheit versus a full vigorous boil. Uh, In addition to decreasing the cost of energy needed for a vigorous boil, reducing to a simmer would decrease water loss, as you mentioned. For those of us that need to rely on distilled water, this would be an additional savings. Uh, Also, starting with a full boil and then decreasing to a simmer would give you a clear starting point for the boil, something you wondered about in the podcast. Matt, what do you think, man? Yeah, I think that that's an excellent point. I think that actually like the the transitional knowledge from cooking to brewing is a really interesting thing to bring up. Sure. and unfortunately, it's one of the areas I know very little about. Uh, but Martin Bruengard uh, actually gave an incredible talk this year, um, and he, uh, you know, he did a talk on the boil. Um, and there's other research out there that suggests that you know a lighter boil may be uh, may be beneficial. Um, others, like I know that some of the boil vigor experiments, like just full blast uh, boil vigor versus you know kind of a rolling boil, um, and then obviously the work that. Uh, the work that I did that kind of held it at some of the lower temperatures that we see in uh, some of the closed brewing systems that are available out there to people right now. Um, like uh, I think the Pika brew is one of them or the Zomatic. Um, and I, it's, I have a hard time saying that it's going to be a better way to brew. I don't want to go down like that path of right. that one is going to produce a better result than the other. Um, I do think that boil vigor, uh, I think I think it might matter. I would love to see more research on it. But my ultimate recommendation, of course, would be like if it's easy for you to say, OK, I've got this boil. I'm going to start my boil. And then you reduce to a simmer to reduce boil off. Um, and then obviously just to do the experiment of like, do I prefer this beer? More power to you, man. That's yeah. awesome. And yeah. I, like, I'm all for making finding ways to make your brew day better and to make your process more efficient. Yeah, my, my thought on it is that first off, I think a lot of people do brew that way. Um, I you know I know I used to. Uh, nowadays, I just try to keep the the boil vigor between the two batches that I'm that I'm making the same so that oh, it, yeah. it doesn't you know it doesn't potentially create an extraneous variable in the experiment that I'm performing but yeah I think that's I think that I don't think that's an all too uncommon method uh, for 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 you know for brewing beer uh, so yeah, I don't I, and you know, do it man just give it a shot I'm sure it'll work fine for you and if it does you know it makes sense to me uh, thanks for the feedback Adrian if you have show feedback you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy or you can leave us a message by calling nine five one four 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 zero three two zero. So, uh, you know, in in an episode about bias, I thought it would be kind of fun to talk about a style of beer that, uh, that I feel like really messes with people, my people's minds a little bit. And that's white stout. Matt, have you had the opportunity to try a white stout? I have. I've, I've had a couple white stouts in the past. Um, some that were more coffee heavy, um, others that were more, uh, chocolate heavy, like just, and that tends to be, I think the two big camps, like, are you using coffee and, uh, cocoa nibs and like what weight do you place on each of those things? Um, I'm, I'm typically not a fan only because to me, it's just a blonde ale with adjuncts in it. Um, and uh, that's, and you could just call it that and it'd be fine. Um, and it's actually interesting because that you bring it up in the context of bias, because the name of this thing does lend a little bit to what we expect from it. hundred um, yeah. percent. Very, like very much so. Like it leads into that, like, Oh, okay. It's a white stout. So I'm going to be looking for chocolate and roasty and I'm going to expect those things. Um, yeah. And I think that definitely plays a role. So it is really interesting. I'm usually not a huge fan, but I, I would love to be proven wrong. <laughs> 
sometime. Well, uh, a, a, a one of our wonderful listeners out there whose name I completely lost, and and uh, I apologize for that. Sent in a white stout, and uh, you know, for the guys to sample. I do want to say again that I I forgot who you were, and so if you're listening to this show, please shoot me an email. Let me know. I'd love to I'd love to give you some credit for it in a, in a future episode. But uh, yeah, uh, we we got a white stout to taste. I think it was probably the first the guys had ever sampled. Ooh. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Oh my God, smell that. The beer, did you just... <laughs> oh, damn. It's like chocolate and car battery. No, dude, we've done this before. Harness your memory banks. That's got some, like... Accessing memory banks. <laughs> like chocolate smell. Mm-hmm. Remember the uh, chocolate uh, <laughs> barley wine, huh? It's not dark enough, though. It's like coffee It's coffee something. Can I like it? What, do you approve me liking it? Do it. That was a trick. I don't care what you think. Give a rat's ass. Honestly, it's like, minus the alcohol content, something you could order at Starbucks. Yeah, I think he, he ran by there real quick. He's brewing this and like sp- spilled his Starbucks and give me a grande. <laughs> I'll take a grande latte brew. I like it. Yeah. So we got coffee, but it was there anything under that? And come on, we're better than this, dude. It feels pretty strong. It's definitely higher content, right? Seems like it. I'm going to put it at 5%. I'm going to go like 11. I like it. It's coffee and maybe there's a little bit of fruit under there. I don't know. And I couldn't even try I'm not to get any problem. Just couldn't that, even try to guess the type. So I'm just getting coffee, roasty, fruity coffee, chocolatey, chocolatey. Yeah, we'll, that's we'll it. Cover it all. Roasty, fruity, chocolate. pumpernickel, <laughs> fizzy, bubbly. <laughs> Fizzy bubbly. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's good. It's a little burnt, but I get it, I, can I get, get over that. that. You get the burnt. Yeah, it's a little burnt. burnt but I get over at that. The end. Burnt coffee, fizzy bubbly. But I get over <laughs> that. I like it. I give it two jerseys. It, it tastes like it was roasted over campfire. It's thick. It's a little hard to yeah. throw it down. So I give it a six. I still like it. Yeah, it's not bad. Well, I mean, they tasted the coffee. Uh, that yep. and and I'll be honest with you, that there was definitely coffee in this beer. The funny thing to me is they didn't note the color of the beer at all. So they didn't. They weren't <laughs> putting together. I think I think they got the impression that there was probably coffee in this blonde ale, but they didn't uh, until the end. You know, when I revealed it to them later on, they didn't realize that it was kind of this uh, play on a on a stout that it was supposed to taste like a essentially. A, a normal stout that did, didn't look like a typical stout. Definitely. And I think that it's it's interesting because like they, it, it honestly, first of all, it it is astounding to me that they nailed it. Like they, they right <laughs> off the bat. So it says a lot about like what, uh, what the brewer was going for in this instance that oh, he yeah. probably got exactly what he wanted out of it. So great job there. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but honestly, like, and that's the thing, like without, without that background context of, Oh, it's a white stout. It, it is just a Blondale with, or so, you know, a similar, some, a similar style to a Blondale with, with adjuncts in it like it yeah. is <laughs> yeah i think that i think typically there's a good dose of lactose there's a uh, coffee and sometimes cacao nibs something like that but you know yep. um i i i didn't hate the beer i won't be making one or or you know paying for one anytime soon it just doesn't i'm not a big fan of adjunct beers in general so but i but i do appreciate you know whoever it is out there who sent that into us it was a lot of fun to have the guys review it if you have a beer or any other alcoholic beverage you would like reviewed by jersey and tim you can email me marshall at brewlosophy.com and we'll get you all set up we will be right back after this break Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort, from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature, 
in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Hi, I'm Stephen Leach, creator of Brow Supply Brewing Systems, here to tell you about our latest Unibrow Brewing System. Modeled after the brew in a bag method, the Unibrow uses the same kettle for both mashing and boiling, replacing the fabric bag with a stainless basket that can hold up to 20 pounds of grain. A heating element is run by an electric controller that allows for the maintenance of specific mash temperatures and makes mashing easier than ever. Each Unibrow is shipped with a counterflow chiller and the parts required to brew a batch of beer. We're really proud of the Unibrow, and we know you'll love it as much as we do. Go check it out at BrowSupply.com and sign up for our email list to receive special deals in your inbox. What you see is what you get, or at least in our case, what you see is often what you taste. It is a common saying that has some interesting implications when it comes to how humans perceive what we actually taste. And it's interesting that you, I'm glad we selected like the white stout for this discussion for this podcast uh, because like it's very much so similar to this right where you see this blonde uh, probably clear beer and you look at it and think okay this is this might be sweeter um, you think this might be uh, it's not necessarily going to have any of that roasty character it might be more biscuity it might be sure. more of that you know sweet white bread all those things uh, and it's it's that contrast I think that makes it interesting for a lot of people is they yeah. like having that like oh this is it doesn't taste like it should which is yeah. an interesting thing like why should something why should something why does something's look have a taste it's a trip um, yeah yeah exactly like another great thing is uh like what what does blue smell like and <laughs> usually like people have an answer for that kind of a question or what does red taste like um and it's it's just blows me away that like those things have answers to them that we have these strong <laughs> mental associations formed uh, across our senses, and that's actually a really widely researched body of knowledge. Um, yeah. And one of my favorite articles about it is called "The Color of Odor," and it's really it's a really popular article. Uh, you are it's easily accessible online, so I highly recommend you give it a read. Um, but it's done by Gil Moreau, uh, alongside uh, Frederick Brochet, who's actually uh, the researcher who we mentioned in our last episode, uh, who did the chemical object representation in the field of consciousness, um, and Dennis Du Bordeaux. So he, in this experiment, um, Moreau et al. took a white wine and they dyed it red with a natural uh, with a neutral dye. Evil. Um, now the, this is evil. The, <laughs> <laughs> Love it's, it. It seems it seems evil. Uh, I knew it would speak Ugh. to you a little bit. I'm glad we're talking about it. <laughs> I love this study. Um, but the uh, anyway, like the, so the interesting part um, in something like we when we've done similar stuff uh, in other capacities, uh, I like the the feedback of like, okay, well, how do you know the dye is neutral, right? Like maybe maybe the dye influences <laughs> yeah. it. Moreau considered that, and he ultimately ended up doing a triangle test uh, utilizing this dye with a sample size of 300 people. And in that sample size, only 120 people were able to select the odd wine out. So we we can say that that dye was not reliably distinguishable from a wine without that dye in it. Exactly. Um, so so the wine is is neutral, or the dye itself is neutral. So they took this white wine. Uh, and they had 50 people try it. Uh, and then they had them do a word association activity. So it's kind of, uh, you know, you give it a list of words or you, and then you ask people to sort of prescribe um, these words to what they're tasting, what they're smelling, what they're seeing, all of those things. And correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, those words were Please. were uh, basically descriptors that one might expect for white wine and red wine. Yes, correct. It was a, it was a huge body of these words, and they're all just sort of intermixed with one another. It's a way that you eliminate some of the bias involved in the presentation of those words. Right. Um, they're all mixed together, and in the white wine, which was which you know for everyone's reference, the undyed wine, uh, these fifty tasters commonly used words like honey or lemon, uh, straw sulfur peanut mango melon all these words we would expect from like a white uh, a white wine like right. much fruitier lighter all these different kinds of contexts and people something i like to point out about this study and like this corpus of knowledge uh the the tasters were incredibly competent in these words like they were very commonly selected word association scores so that's it's a really high degree of confidence in regards to these uh these descriptors right 
Now the red wine, which is that which was dyed using that neutral dye, unbeknownst obviously to our participants, <laughs> the common words Ugh. were the the number two, the top two words. So just for reference, the top two words in the white wine were honey and lemon. The top two words in the red wine, which is the exact same wine, but with a neutral dye in it, were chicory and coal. Oh, my God. So very, I, just <laughs> so different, so different words, like opposite uh, end of the spectrum. And those two words had a very high degree of confidence associated with them uh, from that from that group. Very high confidence. Now, the interesting part, I think, is so the rest of these words, uh, prune, raspberry, clove, cedar, uh, musk, musk is uh, chocolate. Chocolate is an interesting one. So these these very, very red wine descripting words, uh, like exactly what you would expect if they were actually given a red wine. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the, cra- it- the crazy part about this uh, this list that I like to point out to people is that the tasters were actually far less confident in these this prescription of word uh, aside from chicory and coal. So chicory and coal, you know, vast majority of the group use those words, a little bit less so on the rest of the words uh, compared to the white wine. So there's kind of this like this visual representation that something was up like they're, they're like, OK, this some something is different. Uh, but that said, the words were overwhelmingly red wine descriptors um and so just and that's all it was it was just a dyed wine and people walked away from that it, it, it's an unbelievable experiment it's a great article well yeah and and what you know this experiment what, what i think the essence of this experiment um uh, one of there's a few things that come to mind when i when i have read this experiment the you know 500 times that i have because i just am absolutely enamored by this kind of stuff one of them it, it go, just goes to show that the what what we come to expect based on the way something looks i mean we're judging a book by its cover we absolutely do that not intentionally again this is this is under the surface stuff we see something and then we form this schema in our mind of what this thing based on you know you mentioned you know white stout if i see a white stout from you know 5 feet away down the bar i'm going to predict that it's probably going to be you know maybe a toasty crackery maybe it could be a hoppy beer you know it's going to have that that clean crisp character to it uh but you know and then i go and i taste it and i might even even if it has coffee or cocoa nibs in it uh it maybe you know maybe i'm still kind of won't to perceive the other stuff more yeah i'm probably still going to taste a, a high amount of coffee and it might catch me off guard but when you take something that's identical and you add a a colorant to it that doesn't have any flavor or aroma to it uh you know the the fact that that uh comes back and people are still able to kind of perceive these red wine characteristics and what is ultimately a white wine just goes to show that appearance has what we view you know what we observe has a huge impact on what we ultimately end up perceiving absolutely and it's it's i mean we hear the maxim all the time right that you drink with your eyes um and it's really interesting because this whole drink with your eyes concept isn't necessarily represented in the way we tend to think about judging beer, um, which which blows me away as a beer judge, you know, and that's, uh, you know, I know you have your skepticisms uh, regarding beer judging and I, I have some reservations as well, but I, I, you know, I like judging a lot and I do it um, quite frequently. And on the BJCP score sheet, uh, out of 50 points, for those of you unaware, just a beer can be rated anywhere from zero to 50. Um, if anyone ever gives you a zero, they're doing you a disservice. But the <laughs> the appearance category for a beer is only three points out of those fifty, which it it make it really downplays the fact that appearance influences everything else about the beer as well. Yeah. So when someone's like, "Oh, well, how do I bring this beer to the next level?" and they say, "Okay, well, appearance is only three points," like not not necessarily like if you have a very hazy beer that's supposed to be very clear that's going to be taste and smelled differently than if that haze wasn't present because that's that's the expectation that people have set up that's the model that people have yeah. constructed in their head about this category this the category of this beer yeah and as we deviate from the prototypical model which we talked about in the last episode a little bit uh, but as we de- deviate from that model, we start to create more of a clash in our head about this thing. Sure, um, sure. And and it's it's incredibly interesting to me that we we don't talk about appearance in that way because it's it's just true. Like there's appearance is so heavy on how you think of everything else. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think you look at the 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 
booming growth of hazy IPA. Um, totally. I think a part of, you know, my, I'm, I'm just not a big fan of the, the whole like fluffy mouthfeel thing and all that stuff. I, this is not my thing. I like crisp, drinkable, crushable beers. And, and I just don't perceive New England IPA that way. But in the beginning, you know, I'll admit I, there was, there was a huge amount of bias in me looking at these going, but it looks like mud. I mean, I, you know, um, yes. and, and my, and all of the stuff that comes from, you know, how this, you know, I'm, I'm going to be up at night with a sore stomach drinking this yeasty, hazy beer. Um, <laughs> right. but well, inspired by Moreau's research, uh, again, like I said, I've been, I've, I've known about this for a long time. I love it. Um, I designed an experiment in collaboration with a home brewer in New Zealand. His name is Michael Rhodes uh, that would be presented to tasters at the 2017 New Zealand Home Brewers Conference. Uh, similar to Moreau, I wanted to see how the appearance of beer influenced tasters perception. Um, and to do that, I had Michael brew up 10 gallons of a very, very simple blonde ale using you know, local Kiwi ingredients, which I thought was kind of fun. Uh, when it came time to package five gallons of the blonde ale was kegged as it was. So it was nice and clear and, and yellow. Um, while the other was racked onto 136 grams of cinnamar, which is purportedly flavorless. Uh, you know, it doesn't have a flavor or a smell. It's this liquid, uh, that's produced from carafe malt and it's used to adjust beer color. So, uh, my goal in doing this was to add enough to make the blonde ale five gallons of blonde ale look more like a porter or a stout without actually adding any of the roast character that you would uh, expect in a porter or a stout. And it absolutely did the trick. Uh, the beer was dark. It looked just like a stout. Um, data for this was collected during my interactive talk at the conference and was done a little bit differently than usual. So in total, there were 33 folks in the audience, four of whom I had step aside uh, at, for a minute, and I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, but they, they actually went outside the room that we were in and just chatted with somebody, you know, a confidant of mine. Um, but they were completely not, in, not around when we did the initial part of this experiment. So the remaining 28 people were served both beers consecutively. So there was a line right down the middle of the conference room where I was given my chat. And uh, so half of the group got the the pale version of the Blondale first, the other half, which included Gordon Strong, got the dark version of the uh, Blondale first. And then I had them just do a simple evaluation. And uh, part, you know, it was kind of a long, it was kind of long. I had them rate various things. I wanted to make sure that they couldn't, they didn't get a hint as to what was going on. So they rated the hop character and the malt character and the yeast character and all of that. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into that because we'd be here all day, but um, the beers were absolutely, they were served in clear cups, meaning that participants were completely aware of the difference in appearance. That was the idea. Uh, the tape, but they weren't drinking them side by side. They weren't doing triangle tests. They just thought that, you know, and I think I primed them by saying, I've got two beers that I want you guys to evaluate. We're going to talk about them later. Uh, they were instructed to complete the evaluation in silence. So I asked them not to talk with the people they were sitting next to. And given it was only 28 people, that was pretty easy to control. And so the results of each of these evaluations were then compiled and analyzed. And, uh, you know, we don't have enough time to, like I said, we don't have enough time to go over every little result, but I'm going to get to the stuff I think is the most important. So one of the questions we asked had to do with malt character. Now, you know, when I think of blonde ale versus stout, that's kind of one of the characteristics I expect to be very, very different. Um, and, uh, the tasters were asked to select from five common malt descriptors. Uh, and the question was seated among others about hop aroma and yeast characteristics. Again, it, it, just so that they didn't get the idea that we were doing something wrong here. Uh, here, here. Here's the breakdown of, of the 28 people for the pale version of the Blondale, 19 of the 28 rated crackery or bready as being the most prominent malt character. Uh, only five of the people who were drinking the dark version of the Blondale rated crackery and bready as being uh, the most prominent malt character. Three of the people uh, uh, who rated the pale version as being toasty, while two People said the uh, the dark beer was toasty. Again, that was not that's not too different. But here, here's where we start to get to some of the interesting stuff here. Uh, five people said the pale ale was nutty. Not the pale ale. The the pale version of the blonde ale was nutty. Um, while eleven said that the dark one was nutty. Uh, one person rated the pale version as being chocolate in character. Six people said that the dark one had a chocolate character. Uh, and then zero people thought that the pale version had any roast to it at all. Three people. Three people said that the dark one uh, was roasty. This is a beer that was made without any roasted malt. It had a very 
flavorless, you know, odorless uh, uh, impact on the beer. It was pretty clear to me at this point that, that tasters perceived the dark version of this blonde ale and weighs much more in line with a porter or a stout, even though it wasn't a porter or a stout. Uh, and it, it was exactly the same beer, uh, just dosed with a colorant to make it look different. Uh, so this group of 28 tasters were then asked to try to identify the style of the beer. Here we go. This is fun stuff here. <laughs> 22 people felt that the light-colored blonde ale was either a light lager or a pale ale. And uh, 21 thought the dark version was either a brown ale, porter, stout, or a dark lager of some sort. So that's 22 out of 28 people felt that the, the light version of this blonde ale was a light beer. So they were on point with that. Uh, the other six kind of ranged between like Cal Common and, and, and beers that you could maybe fit it into. 21, 21 out of 28 people thought that this beer that ostensibly tasted like a blonde ale but was just darker in color was a brown ale, porter, stout, or a dark lager. Uh, to me, that finding alone was was just fascinating. Yeah, that it, it, it like I remember when you were doing that uh, study and you started publishing it on the site and it was just blows my mind that even though it's kind of exactly what we would expect from, you know, this kind of an experiment that, that the the darker beer would be represented differently, like in these flavor descriptors. And it's just crazy to me that people like thought it was such an extreme difference uh, that it was like a porter, but it's yeah. kind of right in line with like the Moreau study, right? That the color of odor that people, people's descriptors are very much so in line with the things that they see. Um, and yeah, you know, your, your yeah. site is just very, very tied into the rest of your perceptions. Well, and to see it firsthand made it really interesting for me. You know, I knew what to expect, but even so it was still kind of shocking. Of course, one argument would be that, well, the Cinemar, just same way with the uh, colorant in the Moreau study, the Cinemar was imparting some sort of flavor, aroma, or whatever. Um, so, so what I did is those four people that I'd pulled aside earlier, uh, they'd been standing outside. They had no clue what was going on. We actually blindfolded them and walked them back into the room uh, and uh, had them do some interesting uh, triangle tests. So two of those four tasters were actually served three of the same beers. One of them got all three of the dark version of the Blondale. One of them got all three of the light version of the Blondale. And my purpose here was to kind of re, you know, kind of redo, show people this idea that when you expect there to be a difference, which when you're doing a triangle test, you sort of do, uh, yeah. that you that you will find one. And of course, uh, both of those people thought, even though they were drinking ad- identical beers, all three of them were the same, um, that they they all thought. Now, I should I should little disclaimer: if you're going to blindfold people, you have to serve them the beers. So there were people up there actually, you know, helping people to sip these beers. Uh, but they they did they thought that the there was a different beer an odd beer out and there wasn't um, again we've come to expect that so that was interesting but then the other two were you know they did they performed a more traditional triangle test uh, they got uh, two samples of the pale version of the Blondale and one sample of the dark version uh, of the Blondale now uh, you know this is a tiny sample size we're not going to be able to extrapolate too far but you know the idea here was just to be demonstrable was to show that. Uh, you know, just because something looks different, maybe it doesn't taste dif- different. Um, and, you know, if they were different, we'd expect these two people to be able to identify uh, whatever impact Cinemar might have had. Uh, as I'm sure some people are out there are already guessing, neither of those two people correctly identified the odd beer out. Uh, and, and when we told them, you know, still blindfolded that they were wrong, they kind of, they lost confidence in their selection. Uh, you know, they said the beers were very, very similar. So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, <clears throat> because that was only two tasters, the organizer of the conference, Mike Stinger, he actually took those two kegs. There was a lot of beer left over. He took those two kegs to a homebrew shop that he owns and collected uh, 13 more data points over the following few days for a combined total of 15 participants. He did the same thing that we would normally do. He didn't tell any of the participants that came in what the uh, variable was or anything like that. And he served the beers in uh, in opaque cups so people couldn't see the color difference. And we tell people, you know, don't don't pay attention to what the beer looks like. Uh, e- even, even though these beers did look totally different and the eight or the 15 extra or the 13 extra participants were not like legitimately blindfolded, uh, we only seven more, 
Only seven of those people actually chose the unique sample, uh, which, which we would need eight in order to say that this was a significant finding. And so we were able to say that these beers were not reliably distinguishable, which I just think is fascinating. So you've got these beers that look totally different, that people rated as tasting totally different, but uh, people could not, when uh, you know, blind to what they look like, could not reliably distinguish them. I don't know. Yeah, as- absolutely. It, no, I agree. Like it is. It's crazy, and it it's right in line again with uh, the Moreau study, like the Moreau et al. That uh, like I mean, obviously that wasn't uh, Cinemar, and uh, but it was a triangle test on a neutral dye that was not significant in its results. Um, yeah. and and those results were also like very surprisingly in line with what you had found in that experiment. Um, and I like obviously we are not making a argument here in regards to the statistical veracity of no. uh, the <laughs> of the small sample size. Like I'm not like see they're combined they're perfect no not at all um but it's just really interesting that the results are similar uh and that you know that 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 you found that over time uh especially blindfolded like i wish i would love to see that like more Uh, i'd like to do that again but still blindfolded you know yeah like that'd be cool at the very least, it's corroborative evidence. Um, you Absolutely. Know, go, it goes along with what we've come to expect based on past research on similar uh, you know, phenomenons. And I think that in itself is interesting. The fact that people got to experience it firsthand, I think they really enjoyed that. And I can't help but wonder how it might play into our perception. And I, you know, again, I'm going to fall on my sword here. My uh, ideas about styles like New England IPA or, or just totally. you know, my idea of clarity in general. And clearly perception is a curious and often confusing aspect of human existence. Uh, when we're back from this break, we're going to be discussing a study that looked at the way sound influences the way we perceive beer. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the super fast counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Accelerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering home brewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to Grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool once more head on over to grainfather.com that's grainfather.com and get started today shopping for brewing supplies online can be a real hassle which is why we recommend love to brew they've got great prices super fast shipping and they carry exclusive products like east coast yeast the brewers essentials brand and their award-winning beer recipe kits They're also the only place you can pick up your very own Brewlosophy recipe kit. The numbers don't lie. Love to Brew has hundreds of five-star reviews and thousands of brewers are choosing them for their supplies and ingredients each year. Experience the difference at lovetobrew.com. That's love, the number two, brew.com. When dumping wort-soaked grain and leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. 
throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12 pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and clean up is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. There's something about the fact that a beer's appearance impacts the way we experience its aroma and flavor that on some level isn't terribly difficult to accept, right? Uh, But in a weird way, it seems far-fetched to think that our perception might be influenced by something like sound. Yeah, and it's, it's... You know, like uh, we mentioned earlier in the episode, that maxim of you drink with your eyes, right? No one ever really says like you drink with your ears or uh, you drink with your nose or something like that. Like even (laughs) though your nose, especially your nose, like your sense of smell has an amazingly close tie to your sense of taste. Right. Um, Which one actually like I know we use flavor a lot. We say the word flavor um, in uh, like BJCP scoring and stuff like that. Typically, like in food science, unless I'm mistaken, flavor actually refers to your uh, your uh, the aroma and the taste. Taste the entirety, being like what yeah. you sense on your tongue. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, like when we talk about it, though, we always talk about oh, you drink with your eyes, or oh, you like how it looks. Um, but your sense of smell and amazingly your sense of sound uh, seem to play a role in the way in which you taste something and, and not just like the way you taste something by which I mean uh, like, Oh, it's, it's subjective and fussy, but like you, your, your sense of hearing changes the way you perceive specific, very specific attributes of the things that you taste. That's so crazy to even think about. The study man. that I'm referencing uh, was done by uh, Felipe Carvalho, uh, who was a sound engineer before pursuing his PhD uh, in, in Belgium. And you can actually look up uh, this study. Uh, and there's there's been other studies uh, that have been done on this subject. His is just the most fun, I think. Um, <laughs> but he uh, he has this paper called Tune Your Beer, T-U-N-E, Your Beer. Uh, and in that, Carvalho had like been hearing these assertions that your sense of taste can be influenced by your sense of hearing. And being a sound engineer in his uh, previous life, he was, it was just intrigued by this idea. So he developed 24 tracks of music, uh, soundscapes, right? And so- soundscapes uh, are just, you know, the all of the noises around you at any given time. So it's the white noise. It's the, you know, your, your internal sounds, like all these things, right? It's the amalgamation of uh, all those sounds that you hear. And in that, he made each of those tracks uh, slightly different in order to enhance, you know, quote unquote, a specific character of a beer. And he served... He gathered up 340 participants, huge sample size for something like this, um, and served a Belgian Blondale, a Triple, and a Belgian Pale. Now, Carvalho and his team had uh, individuals, participants, try a single beer twice. You know, no one got all three beers effectively, um, but they did this to kind of represent how, like, whether or not this was true in different styles. Um, And that's something that, you know, we can sympathize with over at Brulosophy. Like, we always talk about the experiments, like, oh, maybe in a different style, this would this wouldn't be true or this would be different. Uh, So he, you know, was very much in line with that, did three, uh, did uh, the, the blonde, the triple and the pale. And without telling them it was the same beer in each of those samplings, all he did was alter the soundscape that he was playing for them. Now, the most staggering statistic, just flat for me at least, is that participants were reliably unable to recognize that they were dri- that they were drinking the same beer. So given, given the exact same beer, and this was all in the same session, like he wasn't doing this a week apart or anything like that, um, Participants were not able to reliably distinguish that these beers were different. That's crazy. I know. I know. It's it's That's absolutely star- uh, staggering. But but I mean, better yet, though, the participants did in fact have specific sensory or uh, you know taste, flavor, aroma, like those kinds of uh, changes in perception based on the soundscape that they were listening to. <laughs> now, on average, like low pitches, like the uh, like you know more base uh tended to be perceived as more bitter and they tended to be perceived as slightly more alcoholic which he speculates that the uh the the perception of alcohol was actually it's more influenced by the change in perception to bitterness right or the change of perception to sweetness and other capacities he doesn't think that's necessarily tied to the sound um but 
he ultimately makes this argument that like in uh, you know, found that these higher pitches, uh, the higher pitch soundscapes were actually increased with uh, increased perception of sweetness in in their flavor of these beers. So very reliably, individuals like changed their perception of these beers just based on the sounds that they were hearing, based on the soundscape that was present. Um, and he he ultimately makes the argument that these soundscapes, he's not sure that they are going to be uh, represented the same way in like popular music. Like if we were listening to the soundtrack of something that it would be equally, uh, equally as egregious in a result, like equally as drastic, uh, because like the soundscapes were very much so, uh, designed to be like pitch heavy and they're very atonal in a lot of ways. And you can look, you can actually find these online. Uh, if you look at the study, well, but that's good he, for me because usually when I'm collecting data, you know, I've got one of three types of music playing in the background. It's either yacht rock, which, you know, we're talking like Christopher Cross, <laughs> Lionel Richie, right. real mellow stuff that I'm hoping makes the beer taste uh, a certain way. But, but it's either that or like, uh, you know, hip hop. I've got whatever, you know, Mac Miller or logic or something like that playing in the background or classic rock, which is tends to be a little bit more tonal and, and loud. Um, yes. I, I wonder, did, w- were there specific things that they found at like specific, like uh, frequencies or uh, types of sound that impacted, perception in any specific way oh yeah no sorry if i if i didn't clarify earlier and like you know i tend to speak quickly when i get excited about this stuff but uh the uh yes like there was there was a a pretty pretty direct relationship where higher pitches um you know uh so pitches that were higher were tended to be associated with an increased perception of sweetness in the beers uh and on the on the contrary like the low pitches tended to emphasize uh bitterness and he thought like obviously like that was the characteristic that was more directly associated with lower pitch soundscapes um and the alcohol there was also a like i mentioned an increased perception of alcohol uh or like you know that they thought it was more alcoholic but Carvalho says uh, that 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 may not be a direct re- relationship right. with the soundscape itself. So my so my uh, forcing Lionel Richie upon my uh, participants while they're doing uh, the triangle test probably isn't having too big of an impact, but still fascinating findings, anyways. Yeah, and it, and you know, it never know. Uh, like uh, like I said, like he's not sure that uh, popular music is going to influence uh, perception as strongly. Um, but he, you know, like obviously says if there are, if previous studies have tell us anything is that they will. Um, and that's something that I would love to try in an experiment sometime is like play yeah. different, <laughs> play different sounds for people and see if they rely, are able to distinguish something better or worse. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. At the very least, it goes to show that, um, all forms of perception, you know, are, we've got these five senses. Some people claim to have a sixth, um, that, 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 you know, one input might influence another. And I think that's really interesting. Interesting. Another, you know, one of the um, a variable that we've been recommended a few times to to toy around with, and I'm still trying to to figure out the best way to design this, is to play different styles of music, say like Mozart or some form of like classical music, uh, for one fermenting beer, while another one gets something like Megadeth or Metallica, and to yeah. see if those living organisms yeast respond in some different way. <laughs> I do think that would be really interesting. That'd be um, cool. But uh, hey, well, you you. Recently got back from the North Carolina Homebrew Fest, and you did a, a, a really interesting talk there about that kind of goes along with this whole bias and beer thing. Before we get to that, yeah. um, I, I want to uh, remind people about our awesome sponsor, Imperial Yeast, uh, who are doing awesome things for homebrewing and brewing in general right now. I actually recently pitched a single pouch of a five month old yeast uh, into a beer and saw airlock activity the following morning. I mean, that doesn't happen with other with other yeast. In my experience, it doesn't. And we're not talking about about starters, vitality, or viability. The stuff is no joke. At 200 billion cells in each pitch right pouch, brewers are ensured a quick and healthy fermentation. Imperial yeast offers a wide range of ale and lager strains, as well as some funkier stuff. If you haven't given them a shot yet, I highly recommend you do. You can check them out. Uh, check out everything they have to offer at imperialyeast.com. Their stuff is also sold at more beer and great fermentations. All right, Matt. So uh, tell us a little bit about this talk that you gave at the NCHF. Oh, totally. So I, I mean, I want to start, I had a freaking awesome time at uh, i i had an amazing time uh out in raleigh uh north north carolina and uh i was i spent a ton of time with the atlantic brew supply guys there and they ultimately ended up brewing this beer for me because after your new zealand one um i was reading through some of the comments you know and people were like obviously expressed like oh well maybe the cinemar has this roasty character to it and that is shaving it right and fair fair criticism maybe totally um totally 
and I, I'm, I'm skeptical, but you know, I'm, I'm not willing to dismiss it either. Um, and so I wanted to start thinking about like, okay, well, what can I do that is a little less seemingly subjective? Um, like how, how can I do something similar or dig into a similar concept without going down the path of, oh, the thing you did influenced the maltiness. So the, or influenced this roast character. So now of course people think it's roasty. So I, ultimately ended up designing an experiment um, that was around the, I called it the perception of objective measures. And what I talked about in this talk is basically what we're talking about in this, uh, in this podcast, but also a little bit more into like how different objective, you know, quote unquote, objective factors influence uh, the subjective perception and how subjective yeah. perception influences objective measures. And there's like that dialogic relationship, right? Yeah. Um, an excellent example of that is that like carbonation is very tied to your perception of sweetness, right. very, like very strongly. Um, and part of that is carbonic acid uh, as, you know, like as carbon is, or, or as carbon, CO2 uh, hits your palate and becomes carbonic acid, a little bit of sourness there, a little bit of uh, change in perception of sweetness, but a lot of great studies around that work. So, Daryl, uh, Daryl Tate from Atlantic Blue, Brew Supply, uh, was awesome during this whole process. Um, and we actually went out drinking later and it was tons of fun. Um, <laughs> he's a good dude. Yeah. He, he's, yeah, he's super <laughs> cool. Uh, we had a great time. And actually, coincidentally, uh, Malcolm Frazier was there, uh, for work. So he, so he and I got to hang out with, uh, you know, the guys from Atlantic Brew Supply, the guys from Omega Yeast. Um, and it was tons of fun. We all went out afterwards. I have this like terrible habit and Marshall, you know, this, like once I hit a wall at the end of the night, I'm like checked out. Like I just go, and I'm, so <laughs> I just party I feel, harder. I know. Yeah, we, <laughs> I feel, I feel terrible at the end of the night. Like all of them were like going, like going strong and they were all like, we were going around Raleigh and having fun. And I was like at a point where I was like, nope. I'm out. I'm tired. Um, so, but I had an amazing time, tons of fun. So the guys from Atlanta brew supply brewed this beer and they brewed a Hellas, uh, you know, just pretty straightforward. It had roughly 20 IBUs. Uh, it was around, which, you know, we can say that's a fairly consistent objective quote unquote measure that there's sure. some, like if there's a chemical way we can measure it. Right. Um, and that's IBUs. Uh, the same thing with CO2, the same thing with gravity uh, or, you know, like the original gravity and the final gravity. These are some of these metrics. Like we have a scientific way to measure that these things are consistent. Um, now that said, what I wanted to do was to see how the color and how the context of a beer influenced our perception of things that we would say are objective. Um, because like one of my one of my favorite things is like we talk about uh, you know bitterness in something like an imperial stout, and some of those are from like sixty to ninety IBUs, and you know in a stout you would never like oh that's way too bitter that's higher than some IPAs right and it's like yes but also no because yeah. like you have that thing contextually like it's the the objective measure is a terrible measure for how it actually <laughs> yeah. is um and I, and that's my favorite thing about beer brewing is like people are always saying like oh well it's it's a stout so you want you want less carbonation it's like not exactly because yeah. the carbonation is actually the same it's your expectation and your perception of the carbonation that's different the context right. of the carbonation so they brewed this hellas and at half of the batch uh daryl had added cold steeped debittered carafa three uh in order just to make it dark. And I got to sample both of these beers ahead of time and they were definitely different. Um, you know, like they, one of them did have a strong roast character to it. I had a couple of people try it. Um, and it was, I actually really enjoyed both beers and it was interesting because like when you give a talk about the perception of objective measures and you're from brewlosophy, kind of like you mentioned with the triangle testing, like there's this expectation that someone's going to try to trick you. Yeah. <laughs> that you're going to get um, screwed around with. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. There's, yeah. there's this huge narrative that's built up. <laughs> and so, so I had to throw in some red herrings um, in regard to what we were looking for in this experiment, because I wanted to try to like, if, if people were going to think I was going to try to trick them, um, I needed to trick them really, really well. Yeah. So we ended up doing um, a bunch of, I, I had people take a survey during this talk. They were served a sample of each beer, the Hellas, and then the Hellas with uh, Carafa Cold Steep, three, uh, debittered Carafa 3, and uh, exact same beer, exact same bitterness, exact same gravities, exact same levels of carbonation, all those things. And 
I had them do um, a perception of a bunch of different characteristics and then a word association activity. So similar to the Moreau study where I had them select from this big randomized list of words um, and just pick the top three. Pretty, pretty straightforward. I, th- I won't necessarily go into too much because like you said, we could be talking forever, but some of the things that radically stood out to me in people's responses as they went through and took the survey for this beer, <clears throat> um, some of the things you would expect, right? Uh, the roasty character, people tended to rate the the beer that had, uh, it, was t- it was 37 total participants in the beer with uh, the Carafa 3. It's gonna, I had 28 people rated a five or above on a scale of seven. So oh, huge, huge amount of people rated it as more roasty as an, or an intense roast character. Yeah. And in the Hellas, uh, actually roughly the same amount, about 28 people said two or less. So almost none, right? Sure. But then, and then we get into some interesting other subjective things. Like people tended to believe that the, uh, there was more fermentation characteristic expressed in the darker beer than the lighter yeah. beer. Yeah. Um, that was a fun one, but <laughs> here's the, here's the things we're interested in, which were, again, were the, uh, the alcohol content, the bitterness and the carbonation level, um, in the alcohol content, fairly consistent out of 37 people. Um, most of the group, about 70% for each group thought it was a four or a five. However, those numbers were reversed in each uh, in each beer. So in the lighter <laughs> beer, people tended to believe it was about 5% alcohol. Um, and that was the, that was about 35% of our responders. Yeah. Uh, and then in the, in the darker beer, about 4% alcohol at 43% of our responders. Wow. I mean, so, th- this is, this is fascinating just to get my thoughts on this out there. Cause I, I unfortunately wasn't able to make it out to uh, rally to hang out with you guys. And, and when Malcolm told me he was going up there, I got yeah, a tinge of jealousy, but uh, the, basically it sounds like to me, what you're saying is that, is that, uh, you know, the darker beer was experienced as being a little bit more roasty than the, than the lighter version of the Hellas, which, you know, you added carafa to it. It, it. That makes sense. Let's, let's just accept that it was a bit more roasty. Like you said, you tasted yourself, right? Yep, I did. So it was a little bit more roasty. But then you get to these more, um, th- these things that you know aren't different, the things that yes. didn't change at all. And people are starting to, again, it's that thing. I feel like that first question about roastiness or whatever it was, the, the, that, that characteristic um, that, that, that sort of like you, I think you were attempting to do this with it is it set people up like, okay, these beers are obviously different. Now they're going to go taste them. So it primed them to expect again, to kind of expect these beers to be different and to rate them independently of each other. And sure enough, we're starting to see the same, the same thing happen as people think that things are more bitter or less bitter based on the way they look. And, uh, despite the fact that they are exactly the same in terms of those certain measures. Yeah, no, totally. Because, and that's, and I, and you're exactly right. Like I wanted to throw people off with those questions. And we asked, I interspersed a bunch of these red herring questions amongst the other kind of objective measure questions, right? Uh, like fermentation character, uh, you know, the finish, whether it was dry or sweet, the hop intensity density, things that are like much more relative um, and, you know, necessarily harder to measure in any accurate way. But then when we get to something like bitterness, which we we have a like a scaled metric for uh, people tend to believe that the lighter beer was actually less bitter than the darker beer. Uh, and that's actually incredibly interesting to me because it's directly the opposite of what was found in uh, some recent research uh, done. If you've listened to the Master Brewers Association podcast, they're excellent podcasts, and they had cited some research that was done at the Master Brewers Association conference where they had found that lighter beers were actually tended to be perceived as more bitter, um, depend <laughs> like based on based on the exact same thing. So, yeah. however, what we found uh, in this was that. Uh, the majority of our participants about again about 67 percent, about 70 percent, said that it was uh two to three on a scale of not better at all to incredibly bitter and then in the darker beer found we had actually about 50 percent say it was a three or four uh, and then we had about 30 percent say it was a two and about five percent said it was a one yeah um, and then yeah. you know other interspersed percentages so really interesting uh that the bitterness came out that way and then the carbonation level was really varied and this was this was what this was actually what I wanted the most, uh, specifically because I was having a conversation with a pro brewer friend of mine, um, 
And their Imperial Stout and their IPA have the exact same level of carbonation. It's 2.4 volumes yeah. of CO2. And when you have that beer, it's, and maybe it's because of like the mouthfeel, maybe it's because it's a stout. There's, you know, it's the context of the beer, but that beer like seems like it's less carbonated. Sure. It definitely seems like it's like a smooth carbonation. And then you have the IPA and it's like more prickly on the palate. And it's, you know, it's more maybe medium carbonation. However, and they're, but they're both 2.4, both 2.4 volumes. Yeah. And so when we look at these, this data, again, 37 people uh, were able to take this survey on a scale of no carbonation to incredibly high carbonation, a uh, light card scale of one to seven. We had in the light beer about 11 people and 10 people say, respectively say that it was three and two as like a level of carbonation. So pretty low on the level yeah. of carbonation overall. And then we had a grand total of uh, seven people say four and then eight people say five. One person said six and no one said seven. Hmm. It compared to carbonation level for a darker beer, which was 15 people. So 40% set of three. Uh, and then 11 people set of two, seven people set of four, three people set of five, no sixes, no sevens. And one person who said one, that there was almost no carbonation. Yeah. Um, and so like when you look at it, like it sounds a little similar, but looking at this data, it's definitely skewed towards the lower end of the carbonation level for this darker beer, yeah. despite the fact that they were both, they were both hit to the same volumes of CO2. Well, and, and really, you know, we're, we, we were talking about, um, you were talking about like a, a IPA versus a stout. That's not what this was. These were both Hellas's with one that maybe had a little bit more uh, roast character because of cold steeped carafa. Um, yes. You know, yes, they are different and maybe they do. We can accept that they taste different. But in my mind, and, it, and again, this was a presentation that you gave. This was not like hardcore, you know, <laughs> university level science. But right. in my mind, you wouldn't expect all of these other things that people tended to perceive as being different to be that much different based on the addition of a small amount of cold steeped carafa. And I think that's, what's the fascinating thing. And maybe on some level, you know, um, uh, there, there's definitely bias involved, right? I see this dark beer. I know what to expect when I drink a stout or a porter or whatever it is. And that's going to influence the way we perceive things. Uh, man, I just think it's absolutely fascinating stuff. Dude, it was it was tons of fun, and the word association scores are pretty pretty in line with what we'd expect as well. I loved these. Um, <clears throat> we had I'll give you I'll just well, just for the sake of time I'll give you the top three of each. Okay. Um, in the light colored beer, people forty six percent of people used the word light, twenty seven percent used the word clean, and twenty six percent said the word sweet. Pretty pretty fair for a Hellas. I think, that's, sense. I think that's about what we'd expect. Uh, in the darker beer, which, like you said just a moment ago, Marshall, is just a Hellas with uh, Carafa 3, debittered Carafa 3 in it, 52% said malty compared to 22% in the light colored beer. 27% huh. said biscuity, which that is not a character you would expect to be more prevalent from the beers in a debittered Carafa 3. Yeah. Right. And then the final one was actually the only one that was consistent, which was sweet, uh, sweet, smooth, and clean, all tied for the third place at 22% of responders, eight people um, in the darker beer compared to um, in the light colored beer, uh, less people said it was smooth, more people actually said the word clean, and less people said the word sweet. So oh. definitely, like there was a huge disparity in the amount of these descriptors uh, yeah. based based on the color of the beer, which yeah. just is crazy. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think that's awesome, Matt. I'm glad you had a great time in, in uh, rally with those dudes and were able to make it. But I think in the end, you know, when we when we put all of this stuff together again, I'm left with this just this kind of feeling that one um, and not in a bad way, but it's difficult to trust what it is we're perceiving as being reality, as being the absolute truth. And, you know, um, I bring it up often. I, I, I talked about the whole beer advocate experience that I had with my buddy and, and kind of seeing these things. And that's that's sort of why I, I opened with that is that, you know, if somebody says that a beer tastes one way and they give their rating, you have to realize that they not only are they biased by their experiences and all, you know, everything that they've experienced in the past uh, to view things or perceive things in a specific 
specific way. But in that moment, um, maybe there is something in that moment that caused them to experience differently for better or for worse. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, to me, it speaks to the importance of trying it out for yourself. And whether that means messing around with a variable in your own brewing or trying somebody else's beer or a commercial beer, you know, do it to the best of your ability. Recognize when we recognize that we are biased like this uh, is the only time we're able to at least toy with the idea of setting that aside and saying, okay, what is it that I really experience about this? How is it that these other things in my world right now and maybe in the past, how might that be influencing the way I perceive this? Yeah, totally. And and honestly, like, I think my big takeaway from this work and similar work, right? Like, cause eth- like ethnography would tell us <clears throat> that, that you, you know, you as a, someone who has a position, someone who has a bias, which you are, uh, you'll you'll never really step away from that. All you can do is take step is recognize your bias, take steps towards trying to reduce the impact of said bias right. or just when you do something recognize the fact that you have a bias and wrap that into your results. And yeah. that's okay. Like Amen. that that degree of truth is totally fine where if there is something that has influenced your perception of something that is normal and that's fine. Like it's not, it's not a bad thing and by any means. And I think the, I like my answer is just embrace it. Like, yeah, we, we just, we have a position We're human beings totally. Okay. And I do think that there is a, I do think that there is collective, uh, there's collective perceptions in the sense of there are commonalities in the ways in which people tend to perceive something, um, without going down the rabbit hole. There's no way to perceive if, <laughs> person A and person B are perceiving that thing in the same way. That's definitely a tough because all of it is from a very, uh, maybe from a very Derrida perspective, it's all, it's all contrast. Like you only know something through the things that it is not, um, yeah. which is a, it's, it's a too deep a rabbit hole to go down, but I'm with you, Marshall. Like just embrace it, embrace the bias, embrace, embrace your position in things. Think about how your expectations and think about how your investment in something are shaping the way you perceive it. And ultimately, uh, the thing you walk away with and just be cool with it. It's totally fine. It's not wrong. It's not. (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, no. And I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think the key to this is being able to accept for one, that we're not the best. We're not that amazing, um, that we're fallible, uh, but also that it's completely okay to be wrong. And, and you know, when it comes to perception, maybe you're not wrong. Maybe what you perceive as peach, I perceive as pear, you know, um, uh, in in a beer at the very least, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Let it be. It doesn't, you, you know, we, we can own the subject activity of, of elements of perception. Um, you know, after talking about this, after doing two full shows on this, uh, kind of heady topic, I'm, I'm kind of left pondering this quote. I believe it was by biochemist Isaac Asimov. Um, and he, he said the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries is not Eureka, but that's funny. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that's all the time that we've got for uh, this episode, and it wraps up our first series on bias and beer. Please let us know whether you liked it or not. You can do that by leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts, commenting on our social media, or shooting me an email. Uh, if you'd like to read more about the experiments discussed in this episode, you can find them and all the other stuff we write about over at brewlosophy.com. The Brewlosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no.